welcome to episode four of StockX TV. I am your host, Josh Luber. We will do a short abbreviated version at the desk today because we want to get right in to a long feature that we're very excited to show you. So let's jump right in to Market Watch. In today's episode of Market Watch, we're going to start with something a little bit different. As you know, StockX has since launched watches and handbags onto the stock market of things in addition to sneakers. So let's start with the bag. Let's start with this bag right here. This bag is part of a collection between Louis Vuitton and Supreme. Back at the end of June, beginning of July, they released a collaboration with over 50 different items. This big keep all right here, which retails for about $3,500, is selling on StockX for over $8,000. As part of the collaboration, there's t-shirts, there's hoodies selling for over $4,000, wallets selling for $1,500, and of course, sneakers. There's uh, three different sneakers, a white, a red, and a black one, and they're all selling for about $1,200 to $1,300. The most notable piece of the entire collection is actually a huge, big trunk. People are asking as much as $250,000 for this trunk. Shipping alone's gotta be at least a couple grand. All right, this is an interesting collection. But let's get back to what we normally talk about, which is sneakers. This right here is the Nike Marscraft Tom Sachs Yard Shoe. This shoe, which is a re-release of a 2012 version between the artist Tom Sachs and Nike, is supposed to be a shoe that you would wear on Mars. The first version, which came out in 2012, if you can even find it, is selling for over three to $4,000 today on StockX. This version, which released for the first time in June and then again with a re-release in July, is now selling between seven and $800. Okay, that wraps up our very quick market watch today because we wanna get right into the feature. But you may have noticed a big blue shoe sitting over there at the end. That is the LeBron 4 birthday. And we pulled that out because we went and looked for the rarest LeBron we could find. This shoe, if you notice, those are not Knicks colors. That's what the Cavs colors used to look like. And that mesh box actually has a metal plate that's got LeBron's birthday on it, December 30th, 1984. And we pulled that out because we wanted to remember a different type of Cavs offseason, a Cavs offseason where we weren't talking about the dismantling of the Cavs. And all we were doing was celebrating a championship. Last year, during the offseason, we had the chance to sit down on the floor of Quicken Loans Arena, where the Cavs play, and have a discussion, a sneakerhead round table with five of the most extraordinary sneakerheads that you'll ever meet. So without further ado, let's go right to Cleveland, to Quicken Loans Arena, and talk to everybody. We're here on the court at the Q, the Cavs Arena. We're not dressed up, so we're not playing today, but I figured this would be a good opportunity to get everyone together and, and talk about sneakers. Why don't we start by just going around and, you know, for everybody, introducing themselves and kind of what they do within sneakers and, and just in general. Uh, my name's John Wexler. I'm Vice President of Adidas Global Entertainment and Influencer Marketing. And what that means is our teams around the world are responsible for seeding and product placement across film, TV, music video, what have you, and negotiating all the relationships with celebrities and non-athletes that the brand works with. My name is Kevin Nagani, uh, Sports Center anchor at ESPN. And uh, at 10 years old, I remember being made fun of because I had awful looking plastic shoes. <laughs> and I've been obsessed with sneakers and shoes since. I'm Fomer Simpson. Um, I have a YouTube channel. My brother and I do sneaker related videos, everything from performance stuff to the lifestyle side of things. So I went to uh, LaSalle Academy, which is uh, Ron Artest, God Sham God, uh, Lenny Cook. Played basketball my whole life. Um, that's kind of was another in as far as sneakers went. You know, when I was a little kid, guys like Penny Hardaway and Chris Webber, it was like, you know, that was a, a huge tie into the sneakers and stuff. I also played in college and then I played professionally overseas in Chile, uh, Germany and Mexico. Um, so I, I've been around sneakers and basketball my whole life. Yeah. I mean, I think that story, just basketball alone, right? Most of us, particularly the same age, we kind of all have the same story, right? It was to grow up playing basketball when Jordan played. You know, I never played in college or professionally like Fomer did, right? But, you know, I always played basketball and 
we all the same thing. Jor we played when Jordan played, we wanted Jordans, my mom wouldn't buy us Jordans. I mean, we all have literally like the exact same story of, of anyone you know my age. I never worked in sneakers in any way whatsoever. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I applied for jobs at Nike and Adidas and no one ever returned my, my uh, random uh, resumes that were sent in. Um, so this is about revenge, you have resentment. <laughs> for sure, it was, a it was absolutely about revenge. Um, and. Uh, but like I almost intentionally, I, you know, I was a startup guy for the longest time, and I almost intentionally avoided working in sneakers uh, or, or starting any sneaker-related businesses, almost out of fear of creating a business that was just an excuse to play with sneakers, right? Until one day I found a really good excuse to play with sneakers, or at least sneaker data. And that ended up me creating Campless, which was the sneaker data company, and then that led to that becoming StockX, which is now what we do now, and StockX being a stock market for sneakers. And because of the relationships that we have at StockX with Dan Gilbert to be able to do this here at the Cavs uh, Arena, which is awesome, but also to, to do a lot of fun things and create this show and be able to invite you guys here and just talk with people that I think would be interesting to talk to sneakers about. So, you know, that's you know, StockX and me and, and just happy to be able to, to talk about sneakers with interesting people. So, cool. Cool. Uh, Matthew Panzerino, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of TechCrunch, which is a website about technology. We write about pretty much all tech, but uh, we focus on startups, emerging technologies, young companies, companies founded by uh, people who have passions uh, for things. Uh, my sneaker history is, uh, you know, I was a Reebok pump guy. That was my era. Um, you know, no offense to the the Jordan uh, lusters, but that that pump, that basketball, uh, the orange with the white, you know, tongue. That was I was all about it, and I, I really I lusted after those things. But yeah, I, I enjoy sneakers. I love the the wearable art aspect of them. So yeah, that's my that's my basic history. I'm Andre Lustina, and um, also known as Croatian style. I've uh, kind of been collecting sneakers for 16 years plus. I've um, also, I'm the owner of ProjectBlitz.com, which is kind of like a new project I've been working on the past few years. You know, we kind of curate an entire collection of sneakers. It is on the aftermarket where we were basically selling at the market price, but StockX is actually out there, you know, making uh, determinations of what things are actually, you know, their value and whatnot. Sneakers in itself, after the past um, 16 years, has just become this, this commodity. It's no longer just this whole niche thing where people would be like, damn, why do you have all these boxes of shoes in here? That's kind of crazy. And some girls that were like dating, like, I can't like hang out with any guy that has more shoes than me. <laughs> I think in a lot of other places where you're looking at tickets or other things, they're, you know, hey, this is what I can buy it for, this is what I can sell it for, and that's all I care about. And with the sneaker game, it's, it, it is a game, and those people do play as well. And it's sort of like a testament to the, the drive that people have to like enjoy sneakers and wear them. Uh, it's something just a little bit different than a lot of other uh, double-sided markets like that. I respect the passion in every one of those kids, but I, I agree with you. There's a certain point where the scale goes from extreme passion to just like, I'm just grabbing, I'm ruining other people's experiences to profit myself. As long as there's an authenticity there of like passionate love for the game, if it's sneakers itself, then you kind of got to just accept it, right. like not hate. I think anyone who's a creator, they understand the narrative on top, not just the design itself, but they're like looking for the references that went into it and they know, they know sneakers so well, most of these kids, having grown up in the culture, that they're like it. It, it means more than just the product itself to them. It's like a, a statement that they're making to, to the broader society. So one of the things I wanted to ask for everybody is, like, who are other interesting sneakerheads who we wouldn't know? That, like, either you know personally or, or found out? Because I think that's, like, some of the interesting stuff. You know, we see some of these in social media as they make themselves more, you know, accessible. But, like, I didn't know, you know, about Michael Smith. Michael Smith, Cassidy Hubbard. They all talk about it, and like Ohm Young Masuk, another guy who's an ESPN reporter, to the point where I've said we, we need to do something on ESPN, whether it's ESPN2, ESPN, we're just, we're gonna show all our kicks and just talk about which ones are our favorite. I don't think there is that many people out there right now that we haven't kind of heard of if they're collectors because there are so many blogs and there's, you know, you have all these different channels that are all trying, looking for content. Yeah, I mean, Silicon Valley is, is weird because there's a sort of mentality that if you pay attention to, to material things or physical things, then you're somehow lesser, right? That you have a, uh, your goals aren't in the, your heart is in the right place or whatever. Everything has to be 
you know, about the betterment of humanity. You know, the, the joke is like every product is gonna change the world and make things better. People care about the material things as much as the next person, especially once they can afford it and they start making a little money and they get, you know, stock options at a company that's taken off or whatever. Uh, but what you find is like in the closet, a lot of these guys are actually sneakerheads. Like they do collect. I know investors and people that work at companies and startups and CEOs that do that. A lot of them don't talk about it publicly. Like they don't show off like big collection, but in reality, they got like 800 sneakers, you know? They're but if they all, yeah, they're you know, all asking me for Yeezys. Though. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know. They're probably hitting you me know. too. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's crazy. And like in public, they can't, say, but you know, back, back door, they're like emailing, you know. Run DMC in the 80s. NWA started the whole fat with the, the starter jackets and everything with the Raiders, right? Because they were the entertainers that brought it across the board. So all these guys, the athletes will do stuff and, and they'll do it because they're seeing the entertainers start it first. And then an athlete wears it, then the kid identifies through both of them that it's okay, it's very cool to do all this. Take the Pharrell hat. You know, Pharrell wore the hat to the Oscars, I want to say, and everyone was like, Arby's and all these jokes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then NBA players started wearing it and everybody wanted it. Yeah. So it was like the celebrities kind of take that risk initially, and then the athletes masculinize it, mm -hmm. and then it goes broad. Every, yeah. every Sunday, Cam Newton wears a hat. And it's, it's, we're talking about what he did on the field. Monday morning, we're talking about what did he wear? I mean, because of the hat. It sparks one thing, sparks everything else. We work with uh, Snoop Dogg in football, for example. Like, like if, if you didn't know Snoop the rapper and you just saw him around yeah. football, you'd think he, like he is a legit mind around that sport. And uh, he put our football category on his back for years. And now we have like, we've gone out and signed all these amazing athletes from Aaron Rodgers to Dak Prescott and all those guys. Miller. When you watch a game, you see a number, you see a helmet, you don't see the face. What stands out? The cleats that they wear. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in the last year and a half from like a guy like Antonio Brown, customized cleats. The idea of fighting the league to see if we can wear cleats the way we want to in different colors. And that's how these guys separate themselves with personality. And that's, that's that big fight that's going on right now, showing your personality in a league that doesn't want to show that type of personality. That Von Miller moment on social media, when I saw it, I was like, Wow, yeah, that's crazy. pretty cool. Yeah, I know mean, the NFL. What they banned the shoes and simultaneously posted like six pictures of that shoe on their Instagram the same day. You know, so yeah. like, their all their press was around it, but yes. then they and then they banned it, which then generated more press for us. So it wasn't the worst. Which goes thing back to the '85 <laughs> Jordan yeah. sneaker being banned by the NBA. Yeah. You know, exactly. I don't know if any of you guys saw that we just did this thing with Joe Hayden. So I was at his house and we were looking through um, his cleats and, he, and he's Jordan brand athlete, right? So each year they give him a different shoe. So last year he was had the sevens, this year he has the nines. And I was asking him exactly that. And you know, for, for a DB he's different than, you know, and he said, yeah, he said, when we first put them on, he said there were this and this, I went back and had him remove, you know, material here, remove material here to make it, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, right, those guys have to play. Yeah. The fact that it's a, a basketball shoe, they're conscripting to be a, right. a cleat, but he said the same thing. He's like, yeah, he's like, but now they're great. He's like, you know, the, the actual cleat part and the, and the bottom is exactly what it would be if mm -hmm. it was whatever the highest performing cleat or whatever it is. So yeah. you just he, make the upper look however you want to make it. He look. posted Vaughn's cleats too. <laughs> then he had to delete it. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I can see that I know Tom and all. Yeah. Yeah. I saw it. <laughs> it's just a quick observation. We all love sneakers. Five of us at this table are wearing Adidas. I saw that. I noticed right? that. You're not. I'm not. By the way. I noticed that too, but I appreciate your observation. Well, I've heard so much about the boost. I have to actually wear it once, you know? Yeah. There's no question that there's been this confluence of, you know, four or five just phenomenal things happening at the same time for Adidas. And it's made it a lot more relevant. You see the relevance across the board, right? But within the sneakerhead community, within the resale community, and everything else. I think there's something to be said about, we talked a lot about sort of how you kind of grew up, you know, you flip a couple pairs, be able to pay for your collection. Kids can't do that with Jordan so much right now, today, right? And this is my very narrow perspective on the data and the dollars, but there's, you, kids can't make nearly as much money reselling Jordans today because Jordan in the past couple years has put out a lot more supply, right? Retail prices have gone up, so resale premiums have gone down. So there's only a couple profit dollars. 
there's a lot more profit dollars to be made today if you're selling Yeezys, if you're selling NMDs and stuff like that. It's this idea of like scarcity versus availability, right? It's about having these super limited Yeezys that, that no one can get unless if you know X and I know them and I don't even get them. So, um, or, right? No. But, no, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, that sell for, for a $1,200 premium. Right, as opposed to a pair of Jordans that now almost anybody can get, you know, a general release Jordan, and you can maybe make 30, 40, 50 dollars doing that. So, open question for everyone in general is like, is that a good thing, right? That people now can, everyone can get Jordans, well, or is it better to be in, in, the, in the scarcity region? Let's just say, to make numbers simple, you have 100 people in line somewhere for a Jordan, right? And let's say 50% of them are, are gonna sell it after. Then you have another 50% that are actually just kind of getting it. You don't know if they're getting it because they want to keep it for themselves or they're just kind of into the hype. You take that first 50% out that are buying it to flip it, you raise the prices, you cannibalize yourself, and now those people are gone. So you have only another 50 people there that maybe let's say uh, half of those that are out there that are trying to, to get it only because you know, other people are out there trying to get it, you know, sucked into the hype, boom, they're, they're gone on the next one. So now you just have a small amount left. And what are they? These are the people that everyone was saying, oh, everyone in line, they all want it for themselves, they all want it for themselves. But if you really look outside the box, it's just a perceived value. I think it's really mostly hype driven. It is, but isn't the, isn't the fundamental human behavior that if anybody can walk into the store and buy a pair, if my grandmother can walk into the store and buy a pair, then like, I don't want that, and nobody wants that. It's just a supply and demand equation, right? So if it's a $1,200 premium for a pair of Yeezys or a $40 pair for, of Jordans, it's like, where do you get that line where there's still enough hype and scarcity out there that the people still want them, right? But not so much that, like, I mean, nobody can get Yeezys at retail. If you have the classic uh, Stan Smith, white and green, or you have a classic superstar, or you have, you know, a white on white Air Force One, why does that always sell. Meeting demand on certain models it only creates a more a, be, a better environment for the next releases. But if you create some crazy colorway that no one really cares about, there's nothing behind it, then and but and there's tons of it, you know, then that's when it when it sits. But if it's something that it's classic and it's always going to you know, be in style, you can create a million pairs and eventually, uh, you know, it's going to sell. I think there are like three main aspects to it. So there's storytelling one, which if you create a story that people can buy into, um, that creates like a desire for the shoe and a demand and an ongoing like pursuit of it, right? You're pursuing an ideal, you're not just pursuing the product. And the second part of it is you have the sort of uh, drafting effect. So you create these pole position products, sneakers that are, you know, high design, uh, high demand, low volume, uh, that make a statement about what you want to do, and then your other shoes draft behind it. So there's a, like a brand decision to say, hey, we're going to produce these, we're going to keep them limited quantity. You know, sometimes you, you want to make more than you can't, technologically speaking, or product capacity, you know, production capacity. But sometimes it's just like, well, you know, we're, this is all we're going to make. And that creates that feeling of exclusivity and demand and desirableness. And then the third is like uh, production volume versus demand. And so I think Nike has definitely been twiddling the volume up and to see how high they can get. And you can go like, hey, this is how much money we're giving up, right? So we're giving up, you know, $6 billion a year in, in revenue that we could have gotten if we had produced more sneakers. But you still got a chunk there where you're like, huh, I wonder if we twiddle the knob up, how far we can twiddle it up before that goes like negative. The public needs to be more educated that it doesn't need to sell out to be cool. It doesn't need to sell out. Like it's, it's awesome when you're able to go into a store and actually see cool stuff on the shelf and not the same thing everywhere. Like back in the day, you know, you go to a store. That's how it used to be, right? Yeah, yeah. You could be like, oh man, they still have one of these left? Cool, I didn't get it and, and buy it. Right. And it's fine if, if a shoe sits around for like a, a couple weeks, 30 days, you know? It's this 140 characters, let's get something out real quick, I'm gonna say how I feel and boom, let's move on. Because I look at it like with the iPhone, whenever the iPhone's out, everybody has to be in line, you have to get it quick, and then you gotta wait. Yeah. So everybody has to have it because it's the status that I got it first. Yeah. No matter what it is, no matter if it's good or not, I got it first, you didn't. Mm -hmm. And then there, it, I think it falls under that competition label right. where everybody's trying to beat somebody because they want to stand out and be unique. 
and that's the only way they could be unique. Just because a sneaker is still available a month after the release doesn't mean it's not a good sneaker. You know, you brought that up when you were recommending sneakers and you said the Maroon 6 Jordans and it was still out there. Yeah. It's a great sneaker. It's classic. Just because it's not being consumed by yeah. everybody and you can't find it doesn't mean you don't go out and get it. Yeah. You know, you could still enjoy the process of wearing the sneaker because the way it's built and the way it looks. Absolutely. Yeah. I think about that all the time. Like, I'm like, I don't need to get something because somebody has it and it's sold out. I want to get it because I want to wear it. And, and I like when stuff is more available, yeah. especially now because I don't have the time or energy to jump through hoops to try to get a sneaker. Like if I miss something, like almost never, like will I pay resale? Because it's just like, there's another one coming right behind it. You know what I mean? So it would be great if, because that's how it was back in the day. Like there wasn't even a lot of times like these release dates, like you would just walk into the store and like see what you saw. And it was like, oh, that, that's the new Iverson. You know what I mean? Or just whatever it was. But you know, now, you know, as he said, th things have like shifted a little bit and it, you know, it's not, it's not like that anymore, you know, it's not yeah. the, the kid who was walking around, you know, looking at the stuff, that's such a small percentage. The reason why sneakers has grown to be a little bit bigger now than when it was just like this very small, like mm -hmm. hardcore, like kind of like niche thing is the hype, the hype machine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that the brands who do it well are the ones, like you said, that, that, that balance it, you know what I mean? I mean, I think Adidas has done a great job with that. It's like not too available, it's pretty available. You know, then there's the Yeezys and it's like, ah, Yeezys, yeah. must, must get Yeezy, you know what I mean? Now if we create more things that are interactive, then uh, I think people will start to get that little individuality. But nothing's wrong with hype, everyone likes hype. Of course, you know what of I mean? course, yeah. Oh man, it's, yo, someone is announcing a concert or something like that, like man, really? Yeah, I think kids are just doing what the brands have kind of trained them to do over the last 15 to 20 years. And I think that that's why, you know, it's so controversial when we put out, and speaking on behalf of Adidas there, when we put out like an Ultra Boost and then we don't put it out in significant enough quantity to the point where we feel like we've maximized it, so we come back to it a little bit after that and the word restock has come into this like sort of has a negative connotation. We never put out the level of that first burst that our competition has put out to create that like mm -hmm. sort of cycle. And so we have the ability to keep going back and I think that we're slowly but surely trying to chip away at this idea or notion of, you know, don't get me wrong, there's certain products that will never ever restock ever. But I think that we're still figuring out what that level is and we're trying to do our best to sort of retrain the, the, the community that um, maybe access and availability could be the new hype, you know, to your point of like kids who are open-minded enough to say, well, maybe I don't have to buy into this mindset of like hard launch after hard launch after hard launch where I've gotten fatigue, yeah. like you were describing. Yeah. And, um, but the mindset is so locked into where it is right now that that's gonna be like sort of a longer burn. For, for brands to really to, to negotiate that with, with the populace. Why is restock a negative? Why, why is it? Because it's that scarcity model that, that um, you know, exclusivity drives a lot of hype. So if you restock it, you're kind of like, Bring to the out. kid who got it, who waited release. in line yeah. for the yeah. first release, right. they're like, yo, you just yeah. kind of blew up my bank account. Yeah. Yeah. If you collected original Jordans from the 80s and 90s, and then when they retroed it, you're like, oh, sh they they, uh, they retroed it, right? right? Right. So what do they do? Like they switched a little stitch color somewhere or something on it, right? And then that's supposed to appease some people, but then other people complain. So you're never gonna make everyone happy. But the right. people that always complain about that, and this is coming from somebody that you know their their business is about that aftermarket. I think the the the, re the restocking aspect is actually. A better thing. I do like the version number stuff, like the the Ultra Boost. So the Ultra Boost, like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's official, but the aftermarket stuff is a little 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, yeah. right? And so the the revision stuff. I mean, this is very common in Silicon Valley, right? Like, you know, the first release of your app, the the there's an adage yes. in Silicon Valley: the first release of your app, you should feel embarrassed, right? Releasing the first thing that you release because if you don't, it's too late. Like you're releasing it too late. Get it out, right? Like. And that's called, sometimes called an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. And sometimes there's arguments about whether that's good or bad or whatever, but we'll, you know, that's for another time. You release it, you get that feedback loop, you iterate, you get the feedback loop, you iterate you know, on, the, on the, the product, hopefully while applying 
that human judgment and going like, yeah, I get the feedback, but we've got a vision and we're gonna keep moving in this direction. There's a whole nother level of like nostalgia attached to it, so they can't make big changes and things like that. Um, but in this new world, having something like an Ultra Boost where you know the next one is like, oh, the cage is clear and the, the weave has you know an, an extra two colors in it that allows us more variegation, which gives the you know the shoe a better look from a distance or whatever the case, you know, whatever design decisions are being made on that rapid scale, I think that's very compelling. And it'll, it sort of like takes the air out of the whole restocks like negativity because it allows you to say, you know, you could buy this version, there'll be another version, there'll be another version, just buy what you want. And then it, that sort of takes away the whole like demand thing unless you want it to be there by creating a very small amount or whatever intentionally. I think the technology and supply chain stuff uh, and manufacturing, rapid prototyping and manufacturing like 3D printing and roboticized weaves and things like that are, are going to change the way that a lot of sneakers are made. You know, not probably so much the Jordans, but definitely future models Nike makes or Adidas makes or, or other manufacturers in that way. I think that it won't be too long before we see completely customized sneakers far beyond just like picking colors or, or you know, an ID on it. Just go back to right before we went down the path to NFL. You're talking about um, just the sort of influencers and, and on the music side, right? Mm -hmm. Forget Kanye and Pharrell, like they're at the top and, and they have their own shoes, but it seems to me like we're in an era where anyone who's even remotely a, uh, an artist today, it was like how the NBA was like in the mid 90s, where like everybody had their own signature shoe. It's like everybody's with a brand right now doing something, whether they have their own shoe or whether they're tied to it. I mean, do you feel like that? I feel like name someone who. who as an artist saying doesn't have a shoe. Big Sean, Cameron, uh, like just- like, You're just talking about entertainer-wise? Yeah, like entertainer-wise. Like everybody's got like a shoe at some point and then- was affiliated to some- Yeah, was affiliated yeah, to yeah. some brand, right? Yeah. We had that in the NBA. We had that, you know, everybody had their signature shoe and that all kind of went the way. And I feel like it's gonna shake out at some point soon and that and the brands will stop doing that and they'll still be Kanye and Pharrell and, and Drake and, and whoever is at the top, but- Not all the other. Yeah. The one thing I can observe on is that Social media and, and internet broadcast media that allow creators to speak directly to their followers and directly to their fans that did not exist 10 years ago. There was no, absolutely no way for somebody, an artist, up and coming artist to, to say, this is me, this is my personal style, how you doing? Everything was filtered through six layers of PR and, and releases and contracts and everything else. Now, if you know an artist wants to wear a shoe, they just wear the shoe. That, that direct outlet, that, that sort of raw, real thing, it's what YouTube taps into. You know, when you give your opinion on a shoe, um, theoretically, the trust that you've built up with your viewers, they say, oh, that's what they really feel. And so th I think that brands will continue to seek out those organic moments by going to those people early and kind of, you know, facilitating that. I'm sure that like their agents five, six years ago, seven years ago, when it really started to kick in for like the celeb culture on social media, were like, I don't know if this is good for us right. because they're they're able to communicate without that sort of governing body saying, is this good for your career or bad for your career? Brands work with those people because they're basically, in essence, marketing, right? Ultra Boost, for a minute there, that white on white Ultra Boost was almost like Kanye's shoe for, for, for that moment in time. before The, the one that he wore to the Bulls game? Yeah. Those were energy boosts. That was the J and J. No, well, I'm talking right? about the, the white, white Ultra Boost, right? The white, white, yeah, yeah, the yeah. one with the and the picture of the yeah. jump. Yeah, those are crazy. Those are the J and D's? The, uh, the first one were energy boosts, yes, sounds with like that royal blue hit in the heel. They were just general release shoes. That, that was the moment when everything came to a, this like crescendo because we had just launched season one. He was wearing Ultra Boost around. He's the first guy that, you know, the purple heel, OG colors, wearing that around New York so that we didn't like expose the Yeezys till the launch and all that. And then, um, and the shoe's obviously awesome. And then he did that Bulls game, and it was the, the energy boosts outside the U.S. were very sought after. But in the U.S., they were kind of just moving along. But then he wore those that Bulls game, performed all, all day at that just impromptu. Yeah. And the next day, there were lines around the country at retailers for a general release running shoe. Mm. And that had never happened in the industry mm -hmm. before, ever, like right. in the history. How mindful are you guys when you have uh your clients go to basketball games and what they're wearing. Because honestly, you're getting free pub right there. Everybody on the front row is looking and watching. 100%. And then you get caught in a shot 
or a video, you know, or play, and boom, it turns viral. It's definitely not haphazard. Yeah. It's very, mm. <laughs> it's very planned out. And uh, I mean, guys are hitting us up for tickets from that community all the time. So we, and then if we know that there's a launch coming up, we, we try to, um, you know, put those things together. And if not, then we just try to make sure they're, they're fresh. It, it looks organic, but it's a creative buzz. We've been very blessed. And like, even with the Harden shoe, like YG and uh, yeah. Nipsey Hustle, we're, we're sitting in the front wearing the shoe. Right. And YG and James are our friends. Yeah. So he was wearing James' shoe, even though it was a Laker game. And uh, you know he was shooting on the court with him, which I thought was a really dope that was awesome. photo yeah. moment. That was awesome. And LeBron just hit us up and said they want the court back. So we got to wrap this up. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, his palace. It is, it is his palace. Um, I think JR is waiting for us in the back, though, so we're good. Um, thank you all very much for being here. This was a lot of fun. Um, I hope you guys had fun. Thanks for hosting. Very Thanks cool. for having us. Yeah. yeah, appreciate you guys coming. And uh, I don't know. Let's see if maybe they'll show us around the rest of the place before LeBron gets here. Cool. Awesome. Welcome back. Welcome back to the desk. We appreciate you rejoining us here, and we really appreciate John Wexler from Adidas, Kevin Agandi from Sports Center, Matthew Panzerino from TechCrunch, Fomer Simpson, and Dre, aka Croatian Style, for an unbelievable conversation on the floor of Quick and Loans Arena. That was awesome. Wish we could do that every time, but we can't. However, next time we will have supermodels, cartoon figures, and we will make our own sneakers, and you get to choose one of each. So, um, ideas and thoughts about where the market's going, where we're at today. It's just interesting to hear other people's take on it. Right now, Boost is really the new, the new industry standard for, for comfort. Cool.